Hey, Guru Nation, I wanted to do a quick video. I don't know how quick it's going to actually be. It's going to be as long as it needs to be. But I get this question a lot about initial IRB applications for sites. And it could be pretty cumbersome. Um, I'm not going to lie. It, it could be very cumbersome, actually, to uh, be able to do this properly. But I'm going to walk you through a real-life IRB submission, uh, and I'm going to use CIR, CIRBI, which is Advara. So there's like two main central IRBs that most sites are going to get familiar with. One is WCG, one is Advara. I just picked Advara. They're like, I, honestly, I like it better. Um, and here it is. So I'm just going to go through it. Like just to get to this point, you have to be invited. So you can't just go, if you don't have a study with Advara, you can't just go to this website and look at this. Um, so that's why I made this video because, hey, there's a lot of people out there that are like may, may not know the process. And I know a lot of our clients of DSCS, uh, when they get to this step, it's like very intimidating because this is part of study startup. And I've done videos on study startup before and we just kind of glaze over this IRB application, the initial IRB application, but it's basically like easy. It's just like sometimes overwhelming. So you have to be invited. Like once you're selected as a site, then the sponsor or CRO gives you or whoever as your site is going to be in charge of doing the IRB application. Um, and then you need to associate it with a PI and all that stuff. But when you start the initial application, you select which PI you're going to use from this box. Uh, and then you write the protocol title, protocol number. Then on the next page, it is the investigational research locations and subject recruitment, which uh, they're not going to let me do if I hit continue. So I have to click on it. Uh, do you want to submit sub I information? This is not an IRB requirement. For some, it is. I always put no. Um, although it's probably a good idea if you're grooming your sub I to be a PI that, that you set them up with a profile uh, because then it's going to be easier when they eventually do become a PI that Vara has information on them already. It's just more helpful. Here you will add other members that will need access. So I added myself, um, Katie, who's our CRC, actually all three of our CRCs now, shout out to them. They do this, but I want to be added on all these as the site director. So I get copied on emails. Here you select the location that you will use. So it's your address. Uh, when you add, you just click this add and then it will pull up this other screen where you put in your, your uh, what type of facility it is, what the address uh, and all research activities that will be conducted at this, at this location. How many years this location has been around? Do you have access to the study population? Is a licensed MD or DO available while subjects are being seen? And then it's going to ask, do you have all these things? You don't need all these things to do most studies. We have CPR certified staff. We have oxygen. We have defibr defibrillator. We have in-house code. We have access. Everyone has access to 911. We have a crash card, emergency drug. So we have a lot of this stuff. And then we have, um, Depends on your clinic. You might have none of this. You might have some. The IRB just wants to know because remember, the IRB is in charge of patient safety. So it makes sense for them to want to know this stuff. Uh, then it's going to ask you, and if you have multiple locations, you just do one and then you add another location where the study is going to be done. So some sites, they have like multiple locations where like blood draw gets done here. Um, monitoring is done here you just want to put all the locations from your 1572 form on here uh which of the following subjects populations may be enrolled in the study and you could select multiple uh every study is going to be different please confirm you are not targeting any population for enrollment other than those required by the study design so it's correct why would you do it for this study why would you target anyone that's not appropriate for the study to be in the study you should put i confirm and then how many subjects are expected to be enrolled at your site remember you already got the study so just be like realistic here uh with the numbers and then if you have a site number that the sponsor gave you what is it so every when you're doing a study 
every site has a number. So you might be number one, you might be number 36, you might be number 139, whatever it is. And then if you're part of a site network, click that. Then the next section is about regulatory inspections. So um, have you had any regulatory inspections? So any audits? This is where you enter in the last five years, um, what kind, who, who the PI was, and then where it was, and what kind of audit was it, FDA, OHRP, Health Canada, other regulatory agency, inspection start and end date, you should have the, follow, the confirmation follow-up letter from the audit, and then any findings. So no findings, example is no 483. 483, which is probably the most common. Um, no findings is common, 483s are common, warning letters. Are, are are less common um, determination letters, suspension. I mean, all this stuff you got to put on there. Uh, form four, form four, uh, 483 warning letter action required documents. So then you have to put other documents here, like what was the outcome? They're going to want to know the outcome. Because uh, if a regulatory agency says your site's probably not a good idea to do research, this IRB wants to know. Uh, has the research study or your site been disapproved or withdrawn from another IRB? You got to put yes or no. If previously approved by another IRB, are you requesting transfer of IRB oversight? You will put most of the time put no. Any conflict of interest with that VARA, so PI, sub by any staff, do they um, provide support or own technology being investigated? Now, this is where you have to put like conflict of interest stuff. Most people are going to put no. Do you own stock in a relevant company that is privately held? Do any of the individuals have proprietary interest in the research? So just more conflict of interest stuff. Again, 90% of the time, this is going to be no for all this stuff. Informed consent, this is important, especially for the coordinators. So you're going to generate, you're kind of generating the beginning of the informed consent template. And so you put the office number to be listed on the informed consent form. And then you put a 24 hour line and that's our 24 hour line, but nobody ever calls it really. But sometimes like the IRB will call to make sure someone's answering and um, monitors. We've had monitors call just to make sure that you said you have a 24 hour line. We need to make sure it's there. Patients have never called this 24 hour line. They always call the office line. They text the coordinators. Um, there's more efficient ways for patients to get all of us than 24 hour lines. We've always done outpatient studies. So we've never really had any patient call 24 hour line, but we outsource that to a call center where we'll be notified. They're trained to let the patients know to call 911. And they're also trained to let the patients uh, know if it's not urgent to call us in the morning or they give us the message. Um, and then monetary compensation for the patients. This is where, you kind of have to understand what the budget is going to be, at least in the vague sense, like $50 a visit, $100 a visit. Talk to whoever at your site is negotiating the contract and budget to see what you can put here. And then you got to have to list it here. And then it asks you for the timing of the payments to the subject. So for us, it's subjects will be paid following every completed visit. And if the number is not correct, because oftentimes it's not, the IRB will query you like, well, the sponsor told us it will be like $80 and you put 50 or sometimes we put like a hundred and the sponsor told the IRB it's going to be 80. So these are approximate, just, you can always change it when you get a query like that. They just want to make sure you're all on the same page. Um, will you need informed consent translated in another language? We always put yes because of our community. We're in um, a heavy, heavy Spanish speaking community. So we have uh, Spanish. So you just put here, are you requesting HIPAA waiver? I always put yes. If you don't put yes, they're not going to put the HIPAA waiver embedded in the ICF. So you're going to have to use your own. So we have our own. Oh, you might as well just have one form for the patient to sign rather than multiple. Are you planning to use e-consent to enroll subjects? Uh, we do both. We have paper and e-consent. So we would put yes there. And then there's a message to the end user, which I don't really know what that is. You read it when you get there, it's no big deal. Then it asks about the PI. Okay, how many years has the investigator been involved in research? What is the investigator's NPI number? 
Um, what additional trainings have they done? So usually investigator meetings, uh, NIH protecting human subjects. We all have all of our PIs do this. Uh, if they're in a, any other uh, organizations, um, you can put other as well, like protocol specific trainings. And then um, sometimes they'll ask you to upload these things if you don't have logs. It's good to have like training logs for your PIs. You need training logs anyways for all your studies. So just in case, uh, what is the current number of studies supervised by the PI? They're going to make the determination if the PI is capable of providing oversight. And I don't know what the limit is. They don't really say. It's all like variable based on the site setup. But my site right now has one, two, three. For one PI, my site currently has three enrolling studies and then two in startup. So we put five, we would put five right now. And that's, I mean, I've had PIs with like 15. Um, I think that's like the max I had at one point, but I've never been had any feedback, uh, pushback from the IRBs on that. What is the appropriate approximate number of active subjects supervised? Like there's some sites that PIs are doing like 70 studies, but they have like 20 coordinators. They have like 30, they have a full team. So they're going to ask these next questions are, how many staff members with experience are assisting the PI? And this is where if you have more studies, like you want to emphasize the support staff you have. Questions four through nine, ask about the investigator's specialties and research experience. So here you got to put like what specialty they are, what subspecialty, what phase of studies they've been they've done, what therapeutic areas do they have research experience in, what disease general areas does the investigator have research experience? What groups does the investigator have research experience on? So adults, adolescents, geriatrics. Um, the next section is about site and local context. So any state or local laws impacting research, you're going to have to like do some homework and figure it out. Um, California, for example, has its own Bill of Rights. Um, state privacy laws regarding PHIs, personal health info, age of majority is 19 in Alabama and New England uh, and some Canadian provinces and 21 for Puerto Rico. Um, and then which of the following pending or restrictions like legal, regulatory, professional. I mean, this is all like standard routine stuff. And uh, the thing I like about Advara from my understanding is once you do this for one PI, it has this info, a lot of this info like saved. So it'll become easier to do it. This is why I prefer Advara. I'm not sure if WCG has this feature. Maybe they do now. Somebody let me know in the comments. This is April. This is May. May 25th, 2023, by the way. What recruitment methods may be used at your site? So you check whatever you put here. Will you be paying professionals for their assistance? Yes. And you could put like sub-investigators, staff, whatever you think you need to put do you do you uh have a local irb that's required most sites will say no does your site had a federal wide assurance number this is like from what i understanding and chris i really wanted chris on this show but he got busy right now i think this is for uh generic studies or bioequivalency studies you're not required this to do research some studies you are so at some point your site might want to get one of these it, there's a process. Chris can walk you through it if you're one of our clients, but you can probably Google and see, figure it out. Like I've done this in the past when I'm required to do it. We haven't had it yet for Yuma clinical trials because we didn't need it. So we put no right now. And then how this one's funny to me. It's like, how would you describe the attitudes about research held by potential subjects in your community? I always put neutral because honestly, the reality is patients don't know what research is. So you know, how can they have a positive or negative sentiment about research? Like the attitudes of the majority of people in communities are they don't know anything about research, but I'm sure there's been some sites that have put positive and some negative. And I don't know. I mean, just whatever you think is the right answer here. Uh, and then have there been any recent media focus on research in your community? I mean, we just came out of COVID. There's been media focus on research in the entire world. So everybody can basically say yes. 
but I think they mean more local. So I always put no, because again, in my community and in most, research is not really a focus ever, which we need to change, by the way, but that's a different podcast. Then they got the informed consent process. So this, if you guys, this is your first study, the IRB literally is telling you right here what you need for your informed consent process. This is important when you are doing a visit, especially a screening visit where there's a consent form or if there's a reconsent. Any this is the process of consent you need to document in your source. Like we followed this. And some sites make a checklist and some sites uh write it all out. Uh we have both because we use Creo. Shout out to Creo, our sponsor. Well, we create the source and we can make a checklist in there. And then we have a place to document, like I always write a process of consent or whoever did the consent at the site will write the process, like what they did and <clears throat> any patient specific things. Uh, do you conduct competing trials? It's okay if you do. They just want to know. Specify the location where the consent's done. It should always be in a private room. It should never be in a group setting. At least the way I've done it, maybe somebody out there in the comments is going to say, no, we do it in a group setting all the time. Well, all right. I hope your IRB knows, but usually it's a private room. And matter of fact, let's see what the, um, if there's anything about private rooms or group consents here. The consent. Uh, I actually don't see it, so. Maybe they're okay with group settings. It just as for me as a small site owner, I've never had the need to do like a group consent. Uh, it's always just a good idea to do one on one with patients. Please specify the steps taken by the investigator to minimize the possible coercion. So you just check all these things and put more more things in there. I mean, I hope you're not coercing your patients and so you should actually write out what you do to prevent coercion. We always, one of the things I put is I always discuss alternative treatments with them. And when I start a consent form, I'm actually like weird because I start with like the potential bad first. Like I say, let's get the bad stuff out of the way. These are what's known to possibly be a risk of the study and of this drug. These are what's unknown. These are some of the side effects of special interest. I start with that stuff first. So if you could articulate that into your how you uh, do not coerce, because I, I start with like zero coercion, like negative coercion. I'm like, look, you can quit. This is like the bad that's going to happen. But now let's get into like some of the benefits of it. And I think that's a fair consent process um, that I've picked up on over the last few years. When I was younger, I would like kind of try to avoid some of the bad stuff and um, I mean, we would still go through it in the consent, but I just come up front with it now. I feel like the patients kind of trust you more if you're up front from the beginning. Uh, and I, I don't want to come across as like a salesperson uh, to the patients because most people's red flags go up when that happens. And here's where you attach the CV of the investigator, their medical license number, IRB waiver of oversight. It's not going to be applicable. Um, site-specific recruitment materials. If you have any, you could put there are none to display. You might not have any yet because the sponsors like usually sends this stuff for you. And then any other attachments. And that's it. Then you go to the end of the application and boom, that's it. So it looks intimidating. It's not. I just wanted to walk you through it. Let me know what you guys think. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Trying to keep this as short as possible. Thank you. Bye-bye.